Hi, everyone. Welcome to a, another TechSoup webinar. Today, we'll be talking about crowdfunding and our climate, a digital fundraising plan of action. I'm Nicole Jones from TechSoup, and I'll be your host today. So we've got a lot of people on the line today. This is obviously a topic that is top of mind for many. So before we get into this content, just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping here. So first of all, all lines are muted, but you can ask questions at any time by typing them in to the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. And if you lose internet connection, no worries. You can just reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. And lastly, you'll receive an email with this presentation, recording, and links so you can go back and watch anything that you might have missed. There's going to be lots of ways to engage with us. Uh, so for starters, you can ask questions in the Q&A section. So we will dedicate about 15, 20 minutes at the end to answer these questions. And we'll do our best to get through as many of them. We've got um, quite a bit of people on the line today, so I'm sure we'll get some really great questions, and we're looking forward to them. We also have a couple poll questions that will pop up um, in just a few minutes here. Uh, so if you navigate over to that tab, or actually, I think it should pop up on your screen. So when you see those, just give us your response. It'll just take a few seconds. And lastly, as always, you can tweet at us at TechSoup and use the hashtag TSWebinar. And we really appreciate your attention. We know there's lots of different um, distractions and things that you might need to take care of, of course, take care of urgent things. But um, this is also time for you to learn, time for you to really uh, immerse yourself in this content. And you signed up to be here, so might as well be here and get the most out of it. All right, so with that covered, a little bit about TechSoup. Um, it'd be great to know in the audience chat how many of you have heard of TechSoup before. So just let us know. It's on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So for those of you who are new to TechSoup or maybe need a little reminder, we are a global network bridging tech solutions and services for good. More than 1.2 million nonprofits in 236 countries and ter territories have benefited from TechSoup and recognize TechSoup as their unique resource partner. So this is made possible by the over 100 corporate donors and providers of software, hardware, and services who have chosen the TechSoup platform to create and grow impactful in-kind donation programs. So you can check out all these great offerings from our partners by visiting our nonprofit tech marketplace at techsoup.org slash get hyphen product hyphen donations. And we'll make sure to include that link in the audience chat and in the post-event email that you'll get with the slides here today and uh, a replay, as I mentioned, of this webinar. So I also want to share a special resource page that we've created for nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we're committed to equipping your nonprofit with technology resources you need to meet your mission, serve your community, and support your staff way before COVID-19. We've been doing this for a long time, um, but now more than ever, we know nonprofits are, are turning to us for, for resources, and we're also turning to them to hear of what their experience has been, what needs have been. So that's why we've compiled these resources from tools to support remote work, webinars like this one today, related blog posts, uh, free courses from TechSoup, and so much more. We're constantly updating this page uh, with new resources as well. So we'll share it in our chat, and it's a good page to bookmark. So check us out. Um, that link will be included again once in your chat and also in the post-event email. Okay, and now on to introductions. So I'm very pleased to have us joined by Moshi Hecht. He is a philanthropy futurist, public speaker, and chief innovation officer of Charity, a crowdfunding platform and consulting company that has helped 5,000 organizations raise over a billion dollars. His articles have been published in publications such as Forbes, Nonprofit Quarterly, and eJewish Philanthropy. And we're also joined by our fantastic TechSoup marketing associate, Stephen Davidson, who will be helping out in chat. And with that, I am pleased to welcome Mushi. Thanks for being here, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Nicole. This is going to be my fourth TechSoup uh, webinar, 
and I am happy, pleased, and honored to be here. So like you mentioned, our topic for today is crowdfunding in our climate, eight steps to taking action. Now, it's important to note before I begin that this is a webinar and a presentation and content for both beginners and also masters. So if you are completely foreign to crowdfunding or if you are a crowdfunding ninja, this uh, uh, webinar is for you and there will be what to glean from this uh, webinar. So I'm going to begin just by introducing myself. Again, my name is uh, Moshe Hecht. I am the Chief Innovation Officer of Charity.com. As Nicole mentioned, we've spent the better part of the last seven years helping over 5,000 organizations raising money generally through online. Um, and we've uh, recently hit our billion dollar mark of funds. I would like to start off our presentation with two polls to get a good sense of what our audience is experiencing right now and so that I can uh, fine tune this presentation a little bit based on your response. So my first question to you is, have your donations either A, decreased, B, increased, or no observable change yet in this climate? I'm going to pass it over to Nicole to manage the answers of that. Yes, yeah, so we just sent out that survey. You'll be seeing that come across your screen. And there's some results coming in. We'll just wait a few more moments. Moshi, are you able to see results coming in or would you like me to review what we're seeing here? If you can, uh, oh, so we go to the surveys uh, thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So, unfortunate, uh, but not surprising, we are seeing 52% uh, of you, which is nearly 200 users, have said that their donations have decreased. 14% uh, um, have said that they have increased. So I'd like to introduce the people who have increased to the people who have decreased, and now our problems are solved, <laughs> spreading the wealth. <laughs> and uh, the third, 32% uh, saying no observable uh, change. So um, half of you, uh, over 50% of you have seen a decrease um, in, your, um, in your income, in your fundraising right now. I'm glad to see that many of you have increased. I'd love to get to know you guys um, and no observable change. And that's important for us to be able to get a sense, guys, which this is a, a nice critical mass number that this uh, COVID is definitely having a very significant impact on the bottom line. I'd like to go now to our second slide and ask as follows. What is your crowdfunding experience? So A, are you a beginner? Are you be pretty good? Maybe you've ran one or two campaigns, dabbled it in a little bit, or have experienced maybe on the giving end. Or C, are you a crowdfunding ninja? Have you have are you an expert? Do you have years of crowdfunding experience? So let's go over to the survey's answers on that. Ooh. Interesting. So we are seeing, and I'll give it another five seconds, but an overwhelming majority of our audience are beginners. Hmm. So, you know, that's very interesting, very telling uh, about how uh, unprepared the nonprofit space is at large. Uh, for digital fundraising. So I'm going to close it out at this point. 400 of you answered. That's 85% are beginners. 14% are pretty good. And four users are crowdfunding uh, ninjas. So I think that uh, gives us a very um, sobering reality and a reality check of how unprepared we are. So that also does give me a little bit of 
uh, understanding of who my audience is today. So my audience today are many of you have seen decreases or at least no observable change. Um, few of you have seen increases, and majority of you are new to crowdfunding. So here we go. With that in mind, I'd like to start off by uh, presenting this question to you, and it's not a poll, but I want you to think about it. And I want you to answer this question to yourself. Because of COVID-19, the world is blank. The world is changing. The world is possibly doomed. Um, what does it mean to you, and what is your existing um, mindset today? And I am suggest, su suggesting that the world has changed is not going to help us. That, that um, mindset is not going to get us very far. The world is doomed is for sure not going to get us far. That's only going to bring us backwards. What I'd like to recommend, what I'd like to suggest is that our mindset shifts to the world is advancing. The world is accelerating. We are now no longer in the year 2020. We are, in fact, in the year 2030. We have teleported 10 years ahead in the context of our fundraising, in the context of our professional development. So we all need to accelerate 10 years in our knowledge, experience, and action um, in this age of COVID-19. And in the context of crowdfunding, and I'll go now to my uh, first pre presenting slide, is I would ask the following question to you, and I would have you ask this question to yourself. While all of us are doing amazing, great, beautiful things in our fundraising, we have email campaigns going on, maybe even social media, direct mail, one-on-one um, -on -one solicitations. But I ask you now, for your online fundraising, for your crowdfunding, for your digital transformation, does your campaign or campaigns or strategy have a pulse? Okay, that is what advancing in this age would look like. That is what going from email, to strictly email marketing or direct snail mail, which is all still very good and very important. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But does your online campaign have a pulse? Is it a living, breathing, alive campaign? Now, I'm listing some of the things here of what give your campaign a pulse just to open up your imagination and see what I'm talking about. And then we're going to go through eight different steps of how we can bring your campaign to a pulse. But some of the things that you need to consider, is there a clock? Does it have a time frame? A clock is literally a pulse. Does it have a progress bar? Is it showing your audience where you are in this fundraising initiative? Does it, is it recognizing donors? Is there a donor scroll? Are you looking at a, when I am a donor being solicited online, is it just a form or do I see my community? Do I see everyone else in my community joining along in this effort? Are there videos, pictures, rich content telling the narrative, the story of the organization? And then, of course, the most popular, what we're all talking about right now, even possibly, is there real-time live streaming in your crowdfunding campaign? And you need to answer these questions. You need to look at your plan going forward and say, does it have a pulse? Now, let's go through, through eight um, steps of how to give your campaign a pulse. Number one is setting your goals for your online fundraising. Now, this is for the next six to 12 months. And this could also be for a giving day that you have coming up. But what I would like to say to you is like this, and this is a huge mistake that I see in online fundraising is throwing out a great communication, great solicitation, reaching tens of thousands, if not millions of people, but you have failed to actually set a goal. Your donor needs to understand that there is a point to reach, that there, what success would look like that there is a goal for your online fundraising, whether that means that there is a new ambulance that needs to be purchased and the hard cost for that ambulance is $80,000, whether that means your annual funding for the next three to six months is X amount of money and this campaign is going to cover 20%, 50% of your, of your uh, fundraising, you have to be transparent about what your goals are and bring your donors in on that goal. Number two is setting your goals. 
Okay, how do you set your goals for online crowdfunding? Now, this is a very complex uh, stage in your online crowdfunding, but uh, and you can go as advanced to you know a donor pyramid, where you, like you would do on a capital campaign, where you would create a gift range chart based on existing data, and that is great. You may want to do something smaller, but what I would say to you. Sands and for not including matching gifts or major gifts, you want to look at the first thing you're going to look at is what is your expect, expected average gift size? And then what is your expected donor count? And then you add those two numbers together and you get your goal. Okay? So you can assess your average gift size by many different ways. If you are new to crowdfunding and never done online fundraising, one way would be to look at your last five years of funding, get an estimate of how many donors you have, donors at this tier below $500, as they give an X amount of money, right? Speaking to different platforms, different consultants about what you can expect through online fundraising based on macro average gifts, based on micro av average gifts, obviously you need to um, – um, is is um, um, someone just made the crowdfunding experience chart is still posted? Does the speaker have live slides? So, um, Nicole, if you tell me if I'm wrong, but we are on setting your goals, slide one. Okay. Now, That's correct. The, okay, very good. Now, um, and then you have to calculate how many donors can you expect in your campaign. Again, if you're a beginner at this, you want to look at your donor history. If you have done a crowdfunding campaign, you may want to look at what was our last year crowdfunding campaign. And then based on a strategic plan of your average gift size and donor count, those added numbers together, that is where you begin to formulate your goal. Okay? Now, one thing I will say in that in this environment, in this current state that we are right now, which we're still in this bit of a state of shock, be nimble on your goal. So if this was six months ago and the economy was stable, if anything growing, I would say the, expect the behavior expectation from your donors was pretty um, solid. You can have certain projections. Over here I would say that let's say you have a campaign going out in a month from now, and you set a goal based on, based on these um, studies and based on this consultation, based on the vetting, um, and you set a goal, be careful not to promote that goal many weeks uh, in advance. Be nimble to the changing of the environment that if you might have to, two days before your campaign or two days before you go online with any type of goal, you may have to adjust that accordingly. Okay. Obviously, guys, these are broad strokes, things to think about, but important things and conversation points that you need to be looking at. The second thing we have to look at is to bring a, a pulse to your campaign is leverage. What leverage are you bringing to this specific initiative? Now, the reason why I, I, I say it is in, the, in the form of leverage is because if you want to be successful online fundraising, you need to be thinking about what motivates your donor. Okay? Today is Giving Tuesday Now, which I happen to be a very big fan of. It is reigniting and reinvigorating an appetite for uh, giving uh, by reigniting the appetite for asking because the only thing that is going to grow the appetite for giving is if we gain our and regain our appetite for asking. But there's something interesting about Giving Tuesday now is that it was – the original Giving Tuesday is based on this concept that there's this Black Friday and this Cyber Monday which work and are a thing because of leverage, right? Black Friday is a thing because, listen, we are going to give you 50, 75% off on your shopping today. That's leverage for you. Your every dollar gets you further. You have leverage, so therefore you are going to shop more, Okay. What type of leverage are we now giving to the donor for their charitable giving? And to give your campaign a pulse, you need to be thinking what leverage you're giving. Now, of course, your, your mission is important. Of course, they love you. The fact of the matter is, is that they love a lot of organizations, and they're busy, and they are potentially frugal, or they're potentially educated, especially today, or they're holding on to their, their wallet a little bit tighter. What leverage can you give them? Now, some of the leverage that you can give them is, number one, urgency creating that sense of now, 
Number two is match. That's the best type of leverage. This and this person and this is Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so or this foundation has put up this match, leveraging the community to match. And that can be a 2X match, a 3X match, a 4X match. I've actually seen a 5X match, which is new to me, um, but I'd love to, you know, people are getting uh, creative. Number two, number, uh, another part of leverage is recognition. You will be very surprised how far recognition can go online because recognition is now happening in real time. So while recognition in, for you know, a poster or a name on a wall is only an after fact in years yonder in, pa in, in the past, right? Recognition can now actually be used as leverage because you are recognizing your donors through a virtual online experience which gives the user leverage um, and, and creates leverage for, for the donor because they know they're going to be recognized instantly. And then now finally, another possible way of leverage is creating um, contingency factor on your campaign. Okay? Now, it doesn't need to be all or nothing if we don't reach this, this goal, all your money be returned, but you need to be thinking about what is your contingency factor. Is there a match, and, there won't be, and the match will not be unlocked unless everybody gives? Is there a hard cost that needs to be created? Because if we don't get $80,000 for this ambulance, we're at $75,000, we can't purchase it. We're short $5,000. So you need to be thinking about what's your contingency uh, factor. So um, I'm... Uh, introducing this slide that my favorite leverage here is matching funds As you see on this scale is that and this is something which is very counterintuitive but actually a fundamental and critical part of online fundraising is to not forget about and to not ignore your major givers you must loop them in to the online fundraising crowdfunding space and using them as leverage and a, a final note about um, utilizing matching gifts for crowdfunding is how important radical transparency is then going to be. Um, and you know, we use this word anonymous alike a, a lot in, 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 in fundraising, which is important respecting donors' anonymity. But I would challenge you, because I have seen this make the difference of people donating and not donating. In your online fundraising, when you are using major donors, major gifts, corporate gifts as leverage radical transparency. So if the person tells you, listen, I know I don't, I'm not comfortable with their name, you need to further examine how you can create radical transparency. Maybe there's a name of a business they'd like to promote. Maybe they'd like to do it in memory and honor of loved one. Maybe they can do a name of the foundation. Maybe they do it in the family. Maybe a very specific description of this person, a pillar of our community to give transparency. Because what's going to happen is in this online, real-time, living, breathing campaign that has a pulse, People are going to say, okay, my money is being matched. My money is being doubled. My money is being tripled. By who? Show me the money. You know, it's not, just, it's not enough anymore to say an anonymous donor in the community has d agreed to double your, do double your donation. It's, it's not enough to do that anymore. You have to show that here, this pillar of the community, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, Mrs. and Mrs. So, anybody, this foundation, this corporation, so radical transparency. Now let's move on to messaging as it pertains to um, the crowdfunding. Now, like any great campaign, solicitation, call to action, case for giving, you need to have powerful messaging. And I'm sure all of you on here are, um, you know, this is not, I'm not necessarily the, the, the perfect person or um, the right time to go into a, you know, a long dialogue on messaging. Um, it's, you know, the, the good old classic, get to your mission, get to your vision, have that sticky, you know, headline, call, strict call to action coming at, up at, at, at front. What I do want to address is messaging in our climate, okay? And the biggest question is right now, should I be fundraising? Should we, could we be fundraising today in this time of crisis? Should we be fundraising? Well, I'd like to you to find yourself and I'd like you to answer this question for yourself, and I'm, gonna ha I'm going to help you, allow you to answer this question. The first thing that you need to do is find yourself on this pyramid of relevance in our climate today, okay? So on the top of the pyramid is any organization that I like to call putting out fires, 
okay? Are you a health organization? Are you a food bank? Okay. Are you servicing critical needs? Are you servicing a lot of our customers right now are servicing um, immunocompromised, fatally ill children? So that is very much maybe not on the tip tippy point of this pyramid, but right below in the gray area of a community of immunocompromised children who have been quarantined for the last year while well, we've only been quarantined for the last two years. It's a quarantine on top of a quarantine. Okay. And then let's say all the way on the bottom of the pyramid where you are completely not um, directly relevant to this environment and people could, uh, you know, you, you could hold on to your fundraising for just a little bit and give room and clear the path for people in this pyramid. What I'm talking to right now are in the people who are trying to find themselves on the middle of this pyramid, who are not necessarily putting out fires and are not necessarily some kind of like, nonprofit that is servicing in like a really, let's call it a luxury item, right? And I don't want to call out any specifics because what do I know? It's all about context of who you are, what community. It could be that something which is a, a luxury item for, you know, a, a, a family in New York City may not be a luxury item for someone living in downtown LA. I don't know, right? But I would like you to explore where you are in this pyramid. Now, I put over here in the middle community, okay? Something that I'll give you an example of how to find yourself in this pyramid of relevance where you should, and, and the higher up on this pyramid is the more aggressive you should be. You know, if you're higher on this pyramid, you're going 10, red zone. You're going all the way out, emergency campaign fund, right? If you're a five, then you need to go out. You need to be fundraising. You need to be utilizing days like Giving Tuesday. Now, you have to find an excuse to go out there and good messaging. Now, I'm going to give you an example. I have dealt with in the last uh, few weeks with organizations that are community-based organizations, whether they're synagogues, churches, they're community-based organizations, and they're doing little programs here, here and there for the organization. Um, and they came to me and they said, you know, uh, you know, should we be doing a campaign right now? I said, well, how relevant are you right now? Well, we're doing this program right there. And I said, but, but let's get to the core of things. What do you really, really do for this organization? Well, we, we, are, we are community. We're a, a helping hand when people need help. We're an, we're an emotional shoulder when people need help. We're connecting you to this professional or that professional. So whether it's a – and that can be a, a, a synagogue. That can be a church. That can even be a school. That can be an after-school program. It, it can, and if you can sell, so to speak, the community right now, that's going to resonate. And I've seen successful campaigns. We've already launched in the last um, uh, few weeks campaigns that were a little bit on the edge, a little bit into the middle of this pyramid, and people are giving. And it's resonating with them because it's the, 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 the conversation is, listen, you're gonna need, you've needed community before. We've been there for you. You've needed community now, and we're here for you now. And we're giving out some PPP masks or you know, PPP things, and we're giving out some masks, and we're doing some little things, right? We're not the food bank, or we're not the hospital, but we're doing things and we're going to need to be here in the future for you. So consider to give. And it's working because it's true, because it's honest. You need community. You, no matter what is happening in times of good times, times of not such great times, you're going to need community to continue to thrive in your life. Let's move on. Again, so much to talk about that. But what I would like to you to do is find yourself on this pyramid then consider how hot you're going to. If you're on the top of the pyramid, emergency response fund, red fund. If you're on the bottom, bottom of this pyramid, give it a few weeks. If you're somewhere in the middle, get creative and go out there and fundraise. Timing. Okay? So classically with crowdfunding, timing is very important. And there are three categories of timing I'd like to discuss. Number one is the power of context. Okay? And what better example right now to, as COVID, as power of context, as it is, in, is this good timing or not? Well, you can refer to the previous slide to answer that question. Look at the context of your service and the timing. You know, typically, classically, I would, you know, timing means, you know, is it December where people are in giving mood? Uh, is it um, Christmas, Easter, Passover time where people are in the holiday spirit, right? So, um, those are all things that make you define. Is it the end of school? Is it the beginning of school? You know, all these power of context. Is it dinner season? Is it not, right? You need to look at the power of context to decide whether this campaign is good for, is, is, is good for you. The second thing is like this. 
One of the things that cannot be overlooked in crowdfunding is what I call it's the double M. It's the mystery and momentum. Timing here can be utilized in a very um, interesting way to gain and own the earwaves and the attention span, right? Because fatigue is a, is a big problem when it comes to um, online fundraising, especially with so many solicitations. What I would ask you to ask yourself is before you launch your online campaign, are you going out of the box with every piece of information or are you creating some kind of a mystery and are you building momentum to your campaign? Okay? You know, classically, you know, crowdfunding campaigns, you know, very much started through Indiegogo and Kickstarter for creative projects where set in stone is 30, 60, 90 days. And I find that for nonprofits, that is very counterproductive. You cannot own the attention of your constituents for 30, 60, 90 days. But you could own their attention for a day, two days, three days, um, with a set goal, with a set initiative, with a set um, prerogative. And for that, you're going to need a few days of lead time to build that, that mystery of starting off and saying something big is coming on Giving Tuesday now, something big is coming on June 1st, something big is coming on – and then as you – to maintain their attention and to hold on to their attention, building up that mystery and momentum. So it's something that needs to be utilized through um, um, crowdfunding of, n n at any context that you are in building mystery and momentum. Now, number three is very specific to this time is you can basically – and I would say this is true for the last – um, two months. I believe it's going to be true probably for another month or two in most areas, God willing, if things continue to advance, is I call it the emergence of late night emails. Never in our life have we ever imagined that we would think it would be appropriate to send an email to your constituents at midnight. Well, let me tell you something. Um, and in my experience now working hands on with hundreds of nonprofits in the last two months, you are not sending them an email at noon. Do not send them an email at noon. You know why? Because at noon, they are a principal. <laughs> they are a mother. They are a father. They are a sister. They are a grandmother. They are not in the donor state of mind. Wait till they go to sleep. Wait till they, to their, sorry, after dinner. Wait till they put their kids to sleep. Get them in a mind where they are at calm space, right? So yes, late night emails, as an example, is a time to send emails today. It's when their kids are asleep, kids are down, things are a little calmer, and maybe they're about to go in for a Netflix binge. That's where you get them. That's where you email them. And again, this is just an example, but throw out the entire rule book of timing and think about the behavior and the habits of people where they are right now and when they expect the emails. And by the way, Sunday, yes. Sunday is now a proper, appropriate time to send emails. Before COVID, after COVID, no way. But people are working on Sunday right now. I know I am. <laughs> so again, use your best judgment, but if you remember one thing when it comes to timing is the emergence of late night emails. That's how I like to do it with that voice. Okay, let's move on to social media. Now, I am not going to give you a crash course on best practices of social media. There are enough people on LinkedIn who have messaged you in the last two weeks telling you that they will change your life um, through social media marketing, and some of them will, some of them won't. What I will leave you with is this. If you are going to look at social media as the holy grail and as your only line of communication, you're in trouble. The trick and the key to social media is three things. Integration, integration, integration. That means that if you would like to get someone's attention on their Facebook feed, on their Instagram feed, the only way that you are going to get their attention above all the other noise is if that morning they also got something in the mail. And the only way you're going to get their attention through a LinkedIn post or through a TikTok post or I'm already uh, – I only made the millennial age by one year, so I'm not the best person to talk about the newest and fads. Um, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty in touch. And I will tell you that if you want to get them on social media, it's going to have to come with a follow-up phone call. 
nor it's going to have to be with a food, with a phone bank be, before. It's going to have to be on all your platforms that your audience are. It's going to have to come in integrated with an email campaign and a snail mail campaign. The key to communication today is integration, integration, integration. It is goes back to the classic rules of 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 branding, of communication, is that Coca-Cola knows that if they want you to buy Coca-Cola, and this is for a sugary drink that is probably not going to do great for, for your health, so how much more so for an organization that's changing lives and improving lives, is that you've got to be on the billboard, you've got to be on the radio, you've got to be in the email in blast, you've got to be on TV. So whatever that means for you, look at your models of communication. And if you want to go out and do a crowdfunding campaign, guess what? A big part of that is going to have to be offline. A big part of that is how can I integrate my next email campaign together with my snail mail? Not, okay, in my email campaign I do in December, my snail mail campaign I do in March, and my live gala dinner I'm going to do in, in September. No, what I would propose to you is find out and look at how you can integrate these so that people are, I don't like the word inundated, but people are fully exposed to you in all places that get information in a concentrated time. Let's move on to six, peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, um, I have written many times in my columns in e Jewish Philanthropy, in uh, Nonprofit Pro, on Forbes, that I refuse to separate the terms crowdfunding and peer-to-peer. -peer. I am a rebel and renegade in this area in when it comes to separating these terms because I have been trying to get everybody in the crowdfunding and online space and fundraising space and philanthropy space to stop separating these terms, crowdfunding and peer-to-peer. -peer. I don't blame them because they came into existence at different times and they have separate benefits, but I, would, I, I, don't, I refuse to use them as separate terms. Right? We think of crowdfunding as online fundraising, a link that the organization is sending out. We think of peer-to-peer -peer as, okay, how can we get volunteers to go take a bike ride? And everything. I say that those are one and the same. How can the organization go out and put out their message while simultaneously at the same time, along with the strength of the organization, um, bring in their volunteers to promote that message, to take on their own fundraising goals, and if only think to be an influencer and an ambassador for the campaign. Now, there are three channels of peer-to-peer -peer, um, partnerships that you can do. Number one, obviously, is the obvious one is volunteers, getting people to volunteer for your crowdfunding campaign. Number two is influencers, getting people who have the power of this few, the salespeople, the, you know, the, the, the Malcolm Gladwell mavens and salespeople and connectors um, uh, in your community, politicians, uh, you know, Instagram celebs, any type of, uh, if you're, if you're, you know, a school and you have a mom who runs the PTA, she's an, inf she's an influencer. If you have a, a dad that runs some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a bake sale or, 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 or whatever, those are influencers. And finally, and what I'm seeing in this environment uh, to be the most powerful tool for, um, for a peer to peer is corporations. Okay. This is something which I can have its own full-on own presentation, but you have an opportunity right now to go to local businesses in your community and say that we are doing an online fundraiser. Would you like to, A, make a corporate gift to our campaign? Would you like to, B, maybe take on a goal on behalf of this corporation? Would you make, actually, if they're doing well in business, make a, a sponsored gift? Draw in the corporate corporations in your community, and that's not just corporate matching grants, that's building up those relationships, corporations, volunteers, influencer corporations are all avenues of peer-to-peer -peer that you can build. Okay, number seven, call centers. Well, there's no call centers, so there's no bullet points for call centers. But I bring you, ladies and gentlemen, to my next slide. That is a pajama party. What am I getting at here? Okay. What I f have found is that call centers, what we call in charity, we call them operations rooms, right? You could call them different things, you know, Sunday, fun day, you know, whatever you want to call them. They are the heart and soul. They are the center of your campaigning. Okay. It's the, um, the NASA base, you know, 
the, um, the, and what that does, it's not just bringing people in to make phone calls, but it's creating an energy source for your campaign. Now, if you're doing an ongoing long-term campaign, you can do these quote-unquote centers on Sunday afternoons and bake sales and, and things, or you can do a concentrated effort where everybody comes together on this and this day to call centers, but you can't do call centers today. So what I, we have to get creative, okay? We have to think of what, how can we create pods? How can we create collective groups? How can we create collective energy for the campaign? So for, for your campaigning, because that collectiveness, that interconnectivity, that shared responsibility, that um, togetherness is going to create an energy of your campaign that's going to be need to be used as fodder for your crowdfunding, for your social media presence. You cannot, the, the trick, and this is I tell other people, the trick to online fundraising is using offline initiatives to leverage it. I'm showing you one example of what I have been pitching to some nonprofits um, just as recently, recently is do a midnight pajama Zoom party for your campaign. It is novel. It, it creates that togetherness. It's exciting. It brings um, people together, albeit virtually, but there's something very special and meaningful about doing um, virtual events. Think novel. Think togetherness to to complement to to um, to do instead of uh, call centers. Now, finally, and this is number eight, and I'm going to close with this and open up uh, for questions. There has been a lot of talk in the last uh, few years of how we are directing and positioning ourselves as organizations, and especially how we are developing our messaging and case forgiving for online campaigns. And there's this big um, balance between giving direct, right, versus giving to organization, right? Organizations and the, the organized organizations have been getting a bad rap lately. And, and it's, again, it's a big debate whether there's, uh, there's substance to it. There is some. I think it's a little bit over, overblown. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, everyone's afraid of it. Millennials want, don't want to give to overhead. First of all, not true. Millennials um, that are not educated, don't understand, meaning they're not being educated by the organization, not the uneducated millennials, but they're not being educated by the value of, of, of the overhead and the value of the organization and the value of the impact and the influence that an, organi that an organized body can have are potentially not giving to organizations. Um, versus this giving direct of let's zoom in and let's, I mean, here's Rachel. Rachel is a mother of three. Rachel, you know, has just recently lost her job, and you put a picture of Rachel, right? Or here's, um, here's Eric. Eric is a, a student in this and this community who doesn't have education. You can help for a dollar a day. You can help. And that's, you know, giving to organizations. Here's the X, Y, and Z society, and we're raising $5 million this year. Do what you can versus here's Rachel, here's John, um, and this is their plight, and a little bit can go thing. And we have been gravitating towards making our conversations and making our asks more direct. And that's fantastic because nothing will inspire a donor more than a story, right? But here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to take a step back, and I want you to realize that in our environment, I would challenge you to move actually back towards the strength of organizations. Because guess what? In times like this and in these times, the power of organizations is what's going to get us through it. The power of this platform for doing more, yes, this overhead, this platform doing more is what is going to get us through crises like this and forthcoming crises. The organizational power, the network effects, the strength of the organization, the strength of the brand, the strength of the experience is what they're going. So I would say to you, yes, of course, Rachel and John are going through terrible times, but do not fail to remind your constituents through your online fundraising the power of the brand, the power of 20 years of experience, the power of things, and bring that into your online fundraising. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, that is uh, my close up. My name again is Moshe Hach. I am CIO of Charity.com. We are a, a crowdfunding uh, platform and consultancy. You um, can reach out to me, and I encourage and urge you to reach out to me directly. You can find me on LinkedIn at Moshe Hecht, M O S H E, last name H E C H T. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at and you can tag me. I am very responsive on social media, even more on email. Um, or you can email at Moshe at charity.com. It's charity with a D dot com. Please, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if you'd like to further this conversation, please be directly in touch with me. Thank you very much. Nicole, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Moshe. You're so passionate about this, and I really appreciate all the best practices that you bring to this. Um, we are getting in so many great questions here. So with that, now is your chance to continue asking questions. We're, we're going to go ahead um, and sort these questions by trying to answer the ones that will serve the greater audience as best as possible. Um, but just know we do see each question, and we will do our best to get to each one. So... With that, why don't we dive into our first question here? Um, where do you start if you're a new organization? What would you do, Moshi? Well, I mean, that's the you know chicken or egg. If you're uh, a new organization when it comes to crowdfunding, I would focus on your positioning online. I wouldn't go out and start to crowdfund yet. At the end of the day, the rules of fundraising and of giving will stand true whether it's a one-on-one -on -one solicitation for a million-dollar check or whether it's an online cam campaign for $5. When you're going to ask someone for money, you are not – this is not a transfer of goods. This is cashing in on the investment that you have made on them. So I have serviced you on, on, in the past. I have done good for you. Now here – I'm cashing in on my chips right now, my kindness chips, my, right? Um, so uh, I would say focus on creating your messaging, focus on developing your brand, focus on communications, and when the time is right to then go, okay, we have done X, Y, and Z, and we have, and we have now would like to go out and fund. And that's from a philanthropic perspective, from a, Startup perspective, if your if your you know if your uh, nonprofit idea is so revolutionary and it's so interesting and it's so forth you know um, forward thinking, then people might want to fund it from not from a not from a donor perspective, but maybe from a funder perspective. Maybe from like the same way they go and give ten bucks to you know a Kickstarter project you know for a a a, a, a watch that makes stuck sounds something wild and you know it's wild and new, but they're not going to be giving to you from a donor perspective. They might give you from a funder's perspective. So those are some uh, things to think about in that regard. Great, thanks for that. Let's see our next question here. This is from Phyllis. And Phyllis would like to know, what does the internal structure look like for a successful campaign? What about staffing, assignments, and so on? Sure. So I love that question. And I will say like this. I approach crowdfunding as an avenue to really do some serious damage from your bottom line. Okay? So I'm coming from the perspective of, not to utilize crowdfunding as, okay, we, you know, we have our plan, and let's put some intern and see what we can get from the crowd, right? And I will say to that is that, you know, a campaign that falls in the forest does not make a sound. So I come from the perspective of how can we utilize crowdfunding to leverage our major gifts and then to go out to the crowd and do some real damage and, and raise 10%, 20%. The way I look at it, I always tell a first organization is, let's look at your budget. Let's see what percentage we can raise from your actual budget um, to, to, to raise online. And coming from that lens and that, from that perspective is it's the same amount of people and the same resources you would need when you're planning a dinner. It's the same amount of resources that you would need if you're planning any type of integrated uh, event. What I would have, so you'll need your, you know, you'll need writers, you'll need designers, you'll need fundraisers. And what I would say to you, and I close with this, is do not make the mistake of approaching your crowdfunding campaign 
in isolation. I see a lot of organizations making this campaign saying, okay, well, you know, well, we're, we're only going to engage the marketing team. Right? This is something to do with our major gift officers. This is something to do with our, you know, and that's not true. If you want to succeed at crowdfunding, to truly do some, and especially in this climate when a lot of us, our dinners are being canceled, and a lot of these, you know, golf tournaments are being canceled, we need to approach crowdfunding right now as something that can do some serious damage that can really, really make up for those losses. And in that case, you have to look at it as a fully integrated campaign. Your marketing team, your fundraising team, your development team, and your volunteer team need to be involved in the process. Thanks for that response. And this question I've seen come up in, in multiple ways, and it's one not just today, but in other webinars, a really important one to address. Um, and it comes, this one specifically from Karen, but I've seen other questions on this, and thank you. Her question is, we're a small local nonprofit with most of our donors who are older and may not use a digital platform. So any suggestions on how to reach them? So I think the question of how do we meet those donors who might not have access or might not be as tech savvy? It's a, it's a, that's a fantastic question. And I think it goes back to my slide on social media um, where uh, integration, the answer is integration. Let me give you an example. So we've done campaigns and I've consulted on campaigns where audiences were um, either split or very much on the higher senior level of people older than 50, 60, 70 years old. But still, uh, there are new audiences and, and, the, and the, the desire and the need to tap into a new generation of givers. And one of the things that I advise, just as an example, let's say your campaign is running on, let's say you're doing a giving day, for example, and your campaign is on the first of, 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 of next month. What I would say is do a snail mail, um, put out something in, in, in the mail, and instead of um, – having your dry ask, which usually gives you like a half a percent return, what I would do is I would use this as lead up to the campaign. I would write this email and I would say, Dear Janice, on this and this day, this our organization is going to be raising X amount of funds. We have this and this donor who's going to be matching these gifts, and this is the new program that we are meeting. There are several ways that you can participate. You can either put a check in right now, and on this day it will be doubled, it will be tripled, it will be tripled. Or if there's no match, it will be joined among these things to help us reach this goal. Or you can visit on this on 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 this on this link. Either way, your donation will be applied to this campaign. That is a perfect example of. You do not need to forget about your um, senior givers or less tech-savvy givers when it comes to crowdfunding. It's just about integration. And finally, I will say like this is that that's where customer support comes in. You know, in the, in the early days of, of you know, I'm talking about seven, eight years ago when I used to get really, really involved in crowdfunding campaigns, I used to sometimes be on the phone taking calls from, from, from you know, someone's, uh, someone's buddy saying, you know, I, I came to this link and I, I can't, I don't know how to do it. And you say, you know what you say to them? Hey, I can take the donation over the phone from you right now. How does that sound? So have customer support. Have two or three people dedicated on the day of your campaign to either be calling the people who are, within, who are less tax heavy or, having, or allowing, saying a big number there on the top, call this number if you'd like to make this donation on, over the phone. Excellent. Thank you for that. Let's see. Let's move on to a question here from Marcella. What platforms do you recommend, recommend to organize a campaign? So what's kind of in your favorite stack? Well, I'm, uh, I, I am biased. <laughs> sure. Um, we because, have so many things um, out there, too. Because, yeah, that, because charity is, um, we are a, a platform. But I, what, I, what, I, what I would say is like this. You have to consider whether you are doing, you know, building your own tech, which is a possibility, and if you have those resources for that, okay, um, and there are you know, ways that you can build your own tech. Again, if you have tech resources, generally speaking, I would advise not to. Um, and then you have tech companies and tech services that are very focused on, um, on, on strictly tech. So you have some great ones. You've got Classy. Uh, um, you have uh, Class is one of my favorite. Um, you have uh, GoFundMe Charity. You have Blackboard has services and, and GiveGab. And there's, there's just a whole bunch. Just do a quick do. And then you have Charity, us, which we are an option as well. 
But in addition to the platform, you're also going to need um, strategy. You're going to need consulting. So you either use a platform that has a hybrid of those. We are such a platform where we do both consulting and, and, and strategy. Or if you choose to just use the tech, then you're going to want to engage, um, whether it be a, a nonprofit consultant who has experience in setting those goals. Right? A big, big thing when it comes to online fundraising, crowdfunding, is to not – miss the most important first step, which is sometimes the hardest, which is where you're going to need the most help. Um, and a lot of crowdfunding, cons uh, 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 even nonprofit consultants, even some that have been in this business for 20, 30 years, are getting very savvy in helping to set goals. Um, so those are some of the things that you're going to um, uh, need. Great. Thank you. Let's see here. And there's so many great questions. Thank you for sending these. Again, we're, we're going to do our best and we just have a few minutes here. So I am trying to uh, go find questions that um, are, you know, ones that uh, I think could serve the greater good here. So I'm going to take this question from Jennifer. And she says, Everyone says, tell a story, show a client. In the disability community, we have long viewed that as being unethical asking for pity, sympathy, when we are trying to foster respect. So the question is, how can you show an individual beneficiary without exploiting them? It's a great question. Well, uh, you know, that's a fantastic question. I, I think I addressed it a little bit towards my last slide, actually, um, by, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the second part of what I addressed. Well, first of all, you know, common sense is always great. Um, getting their permission um, to to talk about their story. Um, anonymity must be respected. Um, but I, I, what I think is like this. When you're telling the story of an individual, you're not telling the story of that individual. You're telling the story of your organization and the story and the narrative of what you, what, of what you are presenting. So I have found different ways that that, that that can be done. And by the way, anonymity can be used in your favor, where you could be telling the story of this per person, this faceless person, is one of hundreds of people in our organization that have this that have this uh, um, uh, you know this challenge or this you know this this story. And finally, I would leverage that story, especially now in our climate, to not forget to talk about the power of your actual organization, right? So a narrative would be, a safe narrative would be here. The best is if you get permission, because you'd be surprised about how many people are that grateful where they're willing to give, um, the, and, be, and, be, and be classy, be, don't be tasteless. Don't show a terrible picture of them in the emergency room. Show a picture of rejoice, show a picture of them smiling, show a picture of the success, show a picture of the, of the great outcome, right? So that's number one, just be tasteful. When, you, when you're going to do that. But what I would say is like, you know, example, here's Rachel. Rachel has suffered from this and, and this. The X, Y, and Z Foundation has been with Rachel throughout this entire thing among hundreds of other people just, um, just, just like Rachel. And this is what we do, and this is our mission. We help people like Rachel get through this thing. Reach us out today to learn more about how we can do the same thing for you or make a donation today so that people just like Rachel can. So it's, it's being smart. It's using good old classic um, um, mark, you know, um, communication tools. And finally, I would say ask because a lot of times I look at, uh, at organizations and I'm working with them and they say, wow, we have these most amazing stories, but I, you know, we don't want to exploit. I said, stop for a second. Don't be over humble and don't be, you know, uh, you know, don't decide for them, you know, ask them. Yeah. Great, great response. And I know we're just at time, but this last question here that I've also seen come up in multiple forms, it's really around how do we keep, um, asking for donations without overwhelming the same donors. And this ties into another question specifically around crowdfunding campaigns like Giving Tuesday now. Um, how do we, you know, address concerns over, you know, giving now and not giving throughout the year uh, and also make sure that donors are not feeling over asked? Well, that's a great question. And I'll answer it in two ways. You know, you could, you're positioning, a lot of people position the, the, the problem 
And I would say that the problem is not over asking. The problem is under producing. Okay. The greatest organizations are the ones that never stop asking. The ones who raise the most are the ones that never stop. You know why? Because they are so good, equally if not better than asking, they are better than showing the results. When you ask someone for money and then you go blank and silent for two months, yeah, you cannot go ask them again. But if you have a powerful communication plan where you are um, oversharing on the results, then you can overshare on the ask. If you're over asking and under sharing the results of how their funds have gone to create solutions, how their funds are working, what do you think is going to happen? If you make an investment in a business or in an entity and it grows, when you go back to that investor and say, give more, they're going to say, well, yeah, it's grown. I've seen you grown and I give, and I, and, and, and I give more. And now I want to give more. That's one side of the coin. So the, the problem is not over asking. The problem is, over, is under producing. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that the most successful organizations are continuously and always asking because they can, because they have that permission to do so, because they pr pr produce results. And I would say the, and the, second, the other side of the coin is it goes back to leverage. If you, are, if, you, if, if you are going to ask, if let's say you have your ongoing monthly campaigns and you have your, you know, this event and that event and that event, and you say, okay, now how can I ask on top of that? Well, it's very simple. How can you ask on top of that? You can't unless you are bringing leverage. It's the same way you purchase at a certain store and you purchase anything, and, 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 but now I want to go and do a blast sale and I want to do a thing. Well, what are you giving the purchaser? Are you giving them 50% off? Are you, giving them ultimate, are you giving them more leverage to make their giving now more impulsive? Yeah, that's okay. Give them reason to act out of impulse because you are giving them leverage on their gift. You are giving them a match. You are showing them where the goal is going to get us. What is the result? You are creating a time frame for it. You are creating, showing them who else is giving. And finally, you are showing them the results. And you can do that today. So on the one hand, it's under, um, over sheer results and then you have no problem with over asking. And the other ending is that if you want to go out above and beyond everything and do an impulse ask, make sure that you are delivering leverage to that donor. Excellent. Thank you so much, Moshi, for sharing just your passion, your knowledge, and providing a lot of great information within this last hour. So again, to everyone, um, I know a lot of people asked about uh, being able to see these slides. You will get these slides sent to you along with the replay. So you can go back and watch anything. And yes, here is Moshi's contact. Get in, get in touch with him as he offered. Um, he's great to respond and, and he's here for you. So definitely, definitely keep that contact information handy. And with that, just a couple things to close us out here. So uh, when you X out, you're going to see a survey. Please just take a few minutes to fill that out. That really helps us know what type of webinar content we should be planning and other content for our blogs and things like that. So please just take a few minutes to, to fill that out. Um, we do these webinars for you, for our nonprofit community. And speaking of webinars, um, we've got a lot coming up over the next couple weeks here. So you can check out our full schedule at techsoup.org slash community hyphen events. And that's where you can also find all of our past webinars. You can watch the replays and download the slides. Just real quick, so we've got lots of great resources for all you change makers. We've got TechSoup Courses. It's a social uh, learning platform that provides your nonprofit and libraries with solutions-based training. And you can get 10% off a TechSoup course of your choice with this code here that we'll also include in the audience chat and in the post-event email. Uh, just check out our library. I mean, a lot of things uh, that I saw that were asked on questions that we couldn't get to, um, from social media to, you know, just more information about fundraising. We've got lots of great experts who are leading these courses, uh, and it's information at your fingertips, learning at your fingertips. So do check out TechSoup courses. We'll include that link. We'll include that discount code. Um, and also just wanted to share that we've got a lot of different services to help your nonprofits that are implement and manage technology. So this includes emergency tech support. 
all the way to strategic planning and fully managed IT services to help meet the needs of really all types of organizations. So we'll include that link there as well. And just one more reminder about our COVID-19 resources here. Um, you can check us out. It's page.techsoup.org slash COVID-19 resources. Again, we'll include this link for you to easily access, but we're constantly updating it. So do, do come back to check out uh, new resources there. And with that, Moshi, thank you so much for being here again. It's always a delight having you part of our webinars. My pleasure. My pleasure. And thanks again to all everyone who's joined. Really, your engagement is what makes this so great as other nonprofits are learning from other nonprofits. And that's a wonderful thing. So thank you for taking the time to be here. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Stay safe. Be well. See you soon. Bye-bye.